My name is Butch Swaim. I'm National Promotional Director of the National Farmers Organization. And today, on our Midwest Farm Report, I have as my special guest, Mr. Arnold Paulson, businessman from Granite Falls, Minnesota, also manager of the Minnesota Business and Industrial Promotion Agency. Mr. Paulson is uh, past president of the Junior Chamber of Commerce for the state of Minnesota, American, uh, National American Chairman of the Junior Chamber of Commerce in 1954, Minnesota's outstanding young man of 1950, and past president of his local Chamber of Commerce. Mr. Paulson has been having a series of meetings round throughout the upper Midwest, and he has a message that I think everyone in America should be vitally interested in. He's been holding a series of these meetings, and we have entitled these meetings, or he has, I should say, Rural Economic Development Seminars. And the reason he got into these is because he's worked real hard on a lot of committees to attract new industry into the state of Minnesota or the rural communities. And he did a lot of survey work on what's happening in rural America and what's likely to happen and what new industry would have to be pulled in to make up this difference. And Arnold, if you would, I'd like for you to tell our listening audience here on Midwest Farm Report your experience along this line and, and uh, the, what your conclusions are. Well, thank you, Butch. First of all, I'd like to point out that the people of the United States of America have been brainwashed by many of the economists of this nation into believing that we have been living in the greatest prosperity that this nation has ever known. In fact, the President of the United States, in his own words, said that the economy of this nation was rosy, that things couldn't be better that 1964 was the banner year as far as prosperity was concerned. But yet, as we review the history of 1964, we can see that some mighty unusual things happened. Number one, we saw the step up of the urban renewal program. Number two, we saw the revival of the CCC camps or the Job Opportunity Act which was adopted by President Roosevelt during the greatest depression that this nation has ever seen. We also saw the adoption of the anti-poverty program because nine million families, 36 million American people are classified as living in poverty and during the greatest prosperity that this nation has ever experienced. 36 million American people do not have the minimal requirements of food, shelter, clothing, or medical care. Yes, we have been having great prosperity for some, but how about the other half of the population of this nation? Today throughout America, 48% of all of the farmers are classified as living in poverty. Here in the great states of Iowa and Minnesota, 46 to 47 percent of all our people are classified as living in poverty during the greatest depression or during the greatest prosperity that this nation has ever seen. Now these are only some of the problems that will confront this nation in the year 1965 and the years to come. Some of the other problems are urban blight, juvenile delinquency, and syndicated crime. But this afternoon or this evening, I would like to speak to you about the greatest problem of them all, the most complex problem facing America today, and a problem that too few of us people seem to be concerned enough about, the problem of agriculture. But yet all of these problems are problems that each and every one of us should be really concerned about. It demands courageous study and actions on the part of every one of us living in rural America because it's our responsibilities as citizens of this great democracy to make sure that these problems do not exist in our own community. Too many people today have the opinion that democracy is something that lives in Washington, D.C., Boston, or Philadelphia. But remember, folks, that democracy is right here in hometown USA, and that we all must assume the responsibility of defending and preserves our basic, our basic American freedoms and rights if we are going 
to have freedom reign in America. Now, just a few years ago, a staff writer for the Minneapolis Tribune wrote one of the most controversial articles to appear in the state of Minnesota during the past decade, Small Towns Grow or Die by Carl Rowan. Many of these civic leaders and businessmen throughout the state would like to have tarred and feathered Carl Rowan and drive him <clears throat> out of the state boundaries. Why? Because the truth really hurts. Yet, today we find throughout America over 30,000 communities who have heeded the warning of Carl Rowan. Today, throughout the United States, we have over 30,000 business and industrial development corporations that are organized for one purpose, trying to attract an industry to help bail their community out of their economic mess. Over 17,000 of these business and industrial development corporations employ full-time personnel working for the same purpose and objective, trying to locate an industry. But what are the odds? Let's take a look. In the United States today, <clears throat> about 85% of all of our industry employs less than 20 people. Only 4% of our nation's industry employs over 200 people. And we're told that there are only approximately 200 or so major industrial moves throughout the entire country per given year. So you can see what the tremendous odds are for the communities who have resolved to grow rather than die and who are attempting to solve their economic problems by attracting a new industry to their community. Well, now what spurred on this tremendous competition throughout America between these communities who have resolved to grow rather than die? Well, believe it or not, the problem really started with agriculture. Because after all, what purpose have these communities served other than the farmer? In the early days when the pioneers moved west and homesteaded their lands, Small communities sprang up primarily to serve the farmer with their needs. And the larger cities or the hub centers provided the smaller communities with their needs who in turn took care of the farmer. This is basically why we have the thousands of communities that exist today throughout rural America. But yet over the past few years, we have seen countless numbers of farmers driven from the land Already we've seen a decline of approximately two and a half to three million farmers leave the soil. And what effect does this have on rural communities? When we lose farmers, we also lose many other vital businesses that are necessary to the community, such as creameries and hatcheries, automobile dealers, implement dealers, and many other vital businesses such as grocery stores, hardware stores, clothing stores, and so forth. Yes, farm problems are problems that every community should study seriously and with an open mind because agriculture is the largest industry in the world and by, the lar by far the largest industry that we have in our community, in our rural agricultural states. And agriculture certainly deserves more consideration on the part of community leaders and businessmen everywhere. And as I mentioned, countless numbers of communities are eager to attract a new industry to their community. They will raise hundreds of thousands of dollars to try and lure an industry to their community. They will offer free land and free buildings, and they will even raise large sums of money to help finance the industry if they will but move. And yet we will not spend five minutes time sitting down discussing problems with the largest industry of them all, agriculture. Little do we realize what effect the loss of two and one half million farmers will have on rural America. The president, in his state of the budget message, told the American people that one million farmers are all that's necessary to serve America with their food and fiber. We can take that literally, but the tragic of this whole promotion is, is that along with the two and a half million farmers that will leave the soil, we will also lose hundreds of thousands of other private enterprise businesses throughout rural America. Uh, riding in the American farmer in this same leaky boat that's headed for destruction, we will find independent bankers. We will find thousands and thousands of rural independent businessmen. We will find thousands of communities that are also headed for destruction through the loss of this great industry, agriculture. Now, 
thank God that there are people in America today who are concerned about the tragedy that exists in rural America today. I say that the Great Society program that's been inaugurated by the President of the United States is the great suicide as far as rural America is concerned because it will completely destroy the incentive and the opportunity for the common people of this nation to participate in private enterprise. It will destroy their opportunity to own their own business and to own their own farm. And yet this is a problem that is going to affect you, your family, your business, and your own community. Yes, thank God there is an organization in America that is concerned and is doing something to try and stop this mass suicide in rural America. This organization is the Independent Bankers Association of America. They have <coughs> conducted a vast survey of the economic growth of this country to find out what is wrong. Why is it that this nation is having the economic problems that we have? Why is it that 48% of all of the people in this nation are living in poverty? To further their study, they engage the services of the National Foundation for Economic Stability in Washington, D.C. to do a thorough study of the economy of this country going way back to the years of 1929, taking a careful analysis and study of the economic growth year by year up until the present time, 1964. Let's take a look and see of some of the things that have happened to the economic growth in this nation during the last few years. We're taking the years of 1940 to 1950, which has been proclaimed by the economists of this country, that it has been the most stable, basic growth period in the history of our country, because during that 10-year period, the national income of this country increased 196%. The gross value of all farm production sold also increased 195%. Wages and salaries increased over that 10-year period 109%, 195%. And private enterprises' share in profits increased 209%. So you can see how equal the increase of growth of all of the segments of our economy was during this 10-year period. But yet after 1950, something drastically happened to the economic growth of this country. And this is what alarmed the Independent Bankers Association to do something about it, to study and find out the cause of the illness that exists in the economy of this nation. And this is why they brought in the services of the National Foundation of, of Economic Stability to see what they could discover and find out what we can do to solve the economic <coughs> problems in this country. To be real truthful, ladies and gentlemen, for the past 15 years, we have been living in a greater depression in America than we were during the Great Depression of 1933. All of the economic growth that we've experienced in this nation since 1950 has been based on debt, and we owe every penny of economic expansion that we have gained, plus an additional $98 billion. Let's take a look at the economic growth of the various segments of the economy in this country from 1950 to 1963. Labor received an increase of 148%. Rental income in this nation has increased 63%. The profits of our corporation has increased 86%. Net interest profits, and this is the thing that alarmed the Independent Bankers Association, had increased 460% over 300% greater than any other segment of the economy in this nation. And with that tremendous increase in profits, something had to be basically wrong with the economy of this great country. The small business share of the economic growth was 73% increased, while during the same number of years, net farm income took a drop of 16 and 9 tenths percent. And yet we have people in America that are telling us that there is nothing wrong with agriculture. Over the 12-year period, the total national income in this country increased an average of 124%. Now the total economic expansion in the United States during this entire period from 1950 to 1962, we are told, increased to the amount of one trillion 136 billion 500 million dollars but with all of this tremendous economic expansion in this country 
the American farmer did not benefit one penny. Neither did the multitude of small private enterprise businesses in rural America because the greatest stimulator or creator of new wealth in this nation took a 17% loss and this was an effect that was passed down to all segments of the economy starting at the very grassroots in rural America. But how much money will it take to repay this tremendous loss that has been built or established by credit? We are told that in order to pay off just the increase in private debt that occurred in this country during that same period of time, in 1950, the private debt in this country was $200 billion. But by the year 1962, the private debt had increased to 671 and nine-tenths billion dollars. This is an in increase of almost a half a trillion dollars just in private debt. We can take the federal debt and throw it out the window and just concentrate for a moment the effect that the increase in private debt has had on the economy of this country. How much money must future generations earn to create enough profit just to pay up the expansion in private debt that occurred in a 12-year period in this time? We are told it will require $1 trillion, $124 billion of future income just to pay off the expansion in private debt. When we compare this to the economic growth throughout the entire nation during that same period of time, we find that we have a net loss of $98 billion. In other words, this nation must repay every penny of increase in wages that has been experienced or enjoyed by labor. We must repay all of the profits that have been earned by every corporation in America during this 12-year period. In fact, ladies and gentlemen, this is such a staggering figure that if we took all of the profits that has been earned by every corporation in the entire United States during this 12-year period, that it could not pay off just the increase in private debt that took place in the United States during 12 years. And this is what you and I, the American public, have embezzled from our children and our grandchildren. This is almost one and a half trillion dollars that they cannot earn and use to support and stimulate their own economy because this money has been spent, it is gone, and it has been lost forever. And this is money that our children and our grandchildren will not be able to earn to spend and to buy food, clothing, television sets, and other luxury items to support their own economy. But what effect has this had on the overall economy of the country? And what effect is it going to have on our future? Well, first of all, the survey revealed that the corporations of this country have been earning 60 cents net profit off of every dollar that has been paid to the American farmer. Now, how does this happen? This 60 cents is derived after these corporations have paid a 52% corporation tax. Now, this seems impossible, but if I move over to the blackboard, maybe I can illustrate more clearly. In other words, the corporations of this country have been earning 60 cents net profit off of every dollar that we pay to the American farmer. Now, this is after they have paid their corporation taxes. In other words, before they have paid their taxes, the corporations have actually earned a dollar and 23 cents off of every dollar that is paid to the American farmer. How is this possible? Because every farm dollar is instrumental in generating seven dollars of gross national product in this country. In other words, the farm dollars, starting at the bottom of the economy, travels through enough hands to produce seven dollars of gross national product. So in reality, for every dollar that the American farmer has been underpaid ever since 1950, it means that the corporations of this country have lost 60 cents net profit. Had farm prices been 100% of parity from 1950 up to the present day, the corporations of America would have earned a 94% greater profit than they did. But yet at the same time, 
we have been living in a debt-fueled economy and that every penny of expansion that we have had during this past 15 years must still be paid off. Now, how could this have been avoided and how did this originate or what caused it? Well, very briefly, with a few remaining minutes that we have, I would like to show you. In the year 1962, as an example, this nation was $165 billion short of producing a, gross, a large enough gross national product to meet wages and interest in this country. We only produced 63% of our gross national product that was necessary for our people to live. But that isn't bad enough either, because in 1962, we only produced 56 cents of every dollar that was spent by the people of this nation. In other words, 44 cents of every single dollar spent was borrowed money. In the year 1963, it went up. 45 cents of every dollar that was spent in this great nation was borrowed money. And because of this debt-fueled economy in which we have been living has brought on the responsibility in this fantastic increase in private debt. And because of this, we owe every single penny of it plus an additional $98 billion. How could this have been avoided? Very simply, because if farm prices had been 100% of parity by dividing the $165 billion that we were short to our economy by seven, we come up with $23 billion. Had the American farmer received $23 billion more income in 1962, we would have eliminated this fantastic increase in the private debt. It would have made it possible for this country to be paying off a big portion of our national debt, but we didn't do it. Now, in 1962, the American farmer was actually underpaid $35 billion as to what he should have had had he received his fair share with the other economic segments of this economy. So even if he'd received the $23 billion, which could have wiped out that deficit, we still would have robbed the American farmer out of $12 billion. But because of this, the expense that we, the American people, must pay because of robbing farmers is that now we stand on the threshold of losing our very basic way of life in rural America. This is the price that people in rural America must pay. The elimination of two and a half million farmers, hundreds of thousands of rural business, businesses and thousands of communities will go down the drain with the farmer to cover up this fantastic mistake. Ladies and gentlemen, I wish I had another hour to go through this whole program with you and to show you what effect low farm prices have had, not only on the American farmer, but on the economy of your community, how it affects the support of your schools and your churches, your county government, and what effect it has on the tax structure of your state. Just as an example, the state of Minnesota has been losing one and a half billion dollars a year because of low farm prices. Our state legislature is having kittens trying to figure out new ways and means of raising taxes, but yet they fail to take a close look at the thing that is causing these tax problems in Minnesota. Had Minnesota received its fair share of the gross national product, just think of the amount of taxes that the Minnesota farmers would have been paying the state treasury had this one and a half billion dollars come to our state. Think of the thousands of jobs that were lost because this one and a half billion dollars did not materialize. But you, Mr. Merchant, think of the millions of business dollars that Minnesota business and industry lost because we did not get our fair share of the gross national product. Now, this situation is true in every state in the agricultural areas. This picture reflects the economic growth of rural communities throughout all rural America. We are living in serious times, unless those of us who are living in rural America and who cherish this way of life and appreciate and enjoy freedom become concerned enough to study the facts and see how low farm prices affect our very lives, our business, our community, our family, we can lose the basic freedoms that should be ours and that we want to preserve. 
I'm very sorry that I'm running out of time, and I thank you for your kind attention, and Butch, I think you can take over. Well, uh, Arnold, what would you say the, the, the solution is to this problem? Now, you've explained the problem, now let's tell them what, how to solve the problem. Just for, take about a half a minute to sum up. In your opinion, as you put it, the only group working to solve this problem that will solve eventually everybody's problem. Well, Butch, I've been real concerned about this, and the only solution to the problem, as I see it, is one, we have to restore fair farm prices to agriculture. This is the only solution, because regardless of how we look at agriculture, the only problem that we have is price. The large corporations and the economists of this country are trying to tell the American farmer they have to become more efficient, they have to produce more, and they have to be willing to sell their farm commodities for less money. But yet at the same time, they absolutely refuse to accept this law of the jungle philosophy in their own business. And I know that many people think that government can solve the problem. Some people feel that supply and demand can solve it. But we are living in serious times, and we don't have 10 or 15 or 20 years to solve this thing. And unless the American farmer becomes a businessman and concerned about what's happening to him and starts to run his business like a business, organizing, finding ways and means of marketing his products together, and demanding a fair price at the marketplace, we will lose rural America. And this is the one reason, Butch, why I am sold on the National Farmers Organization. Because in my mind today, it is the only farm organization that will be able to solve and save rural America in time. And if you cherish this American way of life, and if you want to keep farmers on the farm, let's make sure that we support farmers and endorse farmers and encourage them to band together and organize a business method in a business way so that they can market and get a fair price for their products. Because in reality, ladies and gentlemen, these farm dollars are the dollars that they want to spend in your stores, in your community. These are the dollars that they want to help support your schools and your churches, your county government and your state government. And these are the dollars that have been lost and these are the dollars that are causing all of the problems that we have with taxes and so forth today. In other words, what you're saying, that everyone in rural America not only ought to support rural America, but ought to support the National Farmers Organization. Because folks, today, the National Farmers Organization is the only real group that are working to get the farmers in position to get a fair price for their production. What they tell us, a lot of businessmen tell me that, well, I'd sure like to go out and support some of these, the, these programs, but, you know, after all, I'm in business, and if I take a stand, I'm liable to lose a customer. Well, Butch, if they don't wake up, and if they don't take a stand, they won't only lose a customer, they're going to lose their business, they're going to lose their home, they're going to lose their community because of it. And we've got to quit worrying about a few customers and organize and fight to do what we can to preserve this rural American way of life. Right, to preserve what customers we have left. Now, folks, you know, prosperity starts on the farm, and it continues on through the economy. In other words, the farm income situation sets the prosperity level of the community, not only of the community, but of the nation. The NFO is calling on the farmers in this area and the business people to join hands, let's solve our problem in America today.